The Statue of Liberty Written by Rachel Horan The Statue of Liberty My name is Patriot, and I'll be your tour guide. Are you ready to visit the next landmark? Let's fly over New York City, Liberty Island in New York Harbor, to be exact. Your eagle eye can see it just ahead. It's the Statue of Liberty. Allow me to answer any of your questions about this national landmark. Where did the statue come from? Just like the immigrants who came to the United States through New York, the Statue of Liberty was not born in the U.S. In fact, it was made in France by an artist named Frederick Auguste Bartholde. The sculptor designed the statue as a gift to the United States from France. It was for the 100th anniversary of the signing of the American Declaration of Independence. It took him nine years to build the statue. Why did Bartholdi build the statue? When Bartholdi visited the United States in 1871, he found the perfect place for a statue that greeted all visitors of the world. He started sketching right away. Bartholdi's idea of the Statue of Liberty came from the Roman goddess of liberty named Libertas. Perhaps his mother inspired him, too, since many believe that the statue's face looks a lot like her. Who helped Bartholdi make the statue? Bartholdi could not have done all of this work on his own. Even though he was the sculptor who came up with the idea, other French experts helped make it possible. Gustave Eiffel helped create the steel frame, or the skeleton, of the statue. Eiffel is well known for the well-known French landmark, the Eiffel Tower in Paris. American architect Richard M. Hunt was the one who designed the pedestal. Of course, Bartholde also had many workers. What is the statue made of? The Statue of Liberty is a steel frame covered with copper. When you think about copper, you think of a reddish-brown metal like a copper penny, right? Well, when the statue was built, it was that coppery color. However, when copper is outside by the water, just like the statue is on an island on seawater, the metal turns green. It's called oxidation. The copper that Bartholde used is actually very thin. Remember those copper pennies? The thickness of the metal is about three thirty seconds of an inch. If you want to see how thick that is, put two of those pennies together. It's thin, but it has kept the statue in shape for over 100 years. What does the Statue of Liberty symbolize? Actually, Lady Liberty has many symbols about her, not just liberty. While she is an international symbol of freedom, she also symbolizes welcome for all of the immigrants that came to the New World. There are seven spikes on her crown. They are in a radiant pattern that represent either the seven continents or the seven oceans of the world. Her torch, which lights the way for everyone, symbolizes enlightenment. It is important because it is a part of her official name, Liberty Enlightening the World. Did the Statue of Liberty make it in time for the 100th birthday? 
Not exactly. It took many years and a lot of money to build the statue. They went from small models to the actual size by working every day for many hours. Even though Lady Liberty did not make it to her pedestal by July 4, 1876, part of her made it to America. The arm and torch were on display at the Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition for the Americans to see and climb. This preview helped make money to continue the construction of the full-size statue. How can I come back to visit the Statue of Liberty again? It doesn't cost anything to visit Liberty Island, but you do have to pay for the ferry to get there. Through the ferry company, you can also purchase a pedestal ticket so that you can take a tour of the museum and go to the observation level. As inspiring as it is to be so close to the statue itself, you will love the view she has of the harbor and the New York City skyline. National Park Rangers are always available to help answer your questions. Hope to see you here again soon. The Statue of Liberty by Number It took nine years to build the statue from start to finish. Bartholde, Eiffel, and their workers worked every day from 1875 to 1884. The statue arrived in the United States in 1885, but they had to wait for the pedestal to be built before they could start reassembling the pieces. Lady Liberty is holding a tablet of law with her left hand. It says, July IV MDCCLXXVI. Those are Roman numerals that mean July 4th, 1776, or the day of American independence from Great Britain. The statue was presented to the United States on July 4th, 1884, but it was not finished on Bedloe Island until many months later. In fact, her birthday is October 28, 1886, when President Grover Cleveland officially accepted the enormous gift. The 350 pieces that made up the statue were packed in 214 crates for the boat ride from France to New York. From the copper exterior to the steel structure inside, the Statue of Liberty weighs 450,000 pounds. She used to be the tallest structure in New York when she was revealed. The tip of her flame is an inch over 305 feet from the ground. About four million visitors come to see the Statue of Liberty each year. They climb 354 stairs from the base to the crown. However, the crown is not open to the public, so you have to make a reservation to go to the top. The torch is not open to the public at all. Musical Instruments Written by Edward Allen Kurtz Introduction Music is the art of putting sounds together to create beauty and harmony and to express emotion like joy or sadness. Music can be vocal. We use our voices to sing a song. Music can also be instrumental. We use a variety of musical instruments to create beauty through music. A good way to understand the different musical instruments is to look at an orchestra. If you stand where the conductor stands, you will see strings, winds, brass, and percussion instruments. If you raise your baton, the musicians will be ready to play. 
Brass instruments. Brass instruments are made of metal like brass, but some brass instruments are made of wood like an alp horn. Other instruments are made of metal, but are wind instruments. For example, a saxophone is made of brass, and a flute is made of metal like nickel, but they are both wind instruments. What makes a brass instrument a brass instrument is the way it is played. The player's lips make a vibration, and air is blown into a mouthpiece. Each instrument has a different way to make different tones, like the slide of a trombone. Examples of brass instruments. There are several kinds of brass instruments. The first kind is called a valved brass instrument. This includes trumpets, French horns, and tubas. The second kind is called a slide brass instrument. The trombone is a slide instrument. Keyed brass instruments have keys, like the cornet. Natural brass instruments have no valves, no slides, and no keys. They are played using only the lips and the air of the musician. The bugle is an example of a natural brass instrument. String instruments. String instruments make sound from the vibration of strings. This sound then moves to the body of the instrument. The body vibrates as well as the air inside of it. This is what causes sound to be produced. There are three kinds of string instruments. The first is the lute group. These instruments have a neck and a bout or gourd. Guitars and violins are members of this group. The second is the harp group. Here, the strings are placed in a frame. The third is the zither group. Strings are placed on a body. The auto harp and the piano are members of this group. Examples of string instruments. Some string instruments are played by pulling a bow across the strings. These include the violin, viola, cello, and double bass. Other string instruments are played by plucking or strumming the strings. Some plucked string instruments include the banjo, guitar, harp, lute, mandolin. Sitar and ukulele. The other kind of stringed instrument is played by striking the strings. The piano is this kind of string instrument. Some people think that a piano is a member of the percussion family. Wind instruments. Wind instruments rely on the wind. Or air from the player to produce a sound. Wind instruments have a resonator, which is usually a tube. The player blows air into or over the mouthpiece at the end of the resonator. This wind produces a vibration, which produces a sound. Some wind instruments require the player to blow air through a reed. This is a small, thin piece of material that comes from a plant called a giant cane. Other wind instruments require the player to blow air across a metal mouthpiece. Examples of wind instruments: Wind instruments that have reeds are called reed instruments. These include the bassoon, clarinet, and oboe. The reed is inserted in the mouthpiece, and the player blows air into the mouthpiece. Another kind of wind instrument 
is called an air reed instrument. Air is blown across a hole in the mouthpiece. This group of instruments includes the flute and the recorder. A pipe organ is a special kind of wind instrument. Air is blown across the opening in each of the individual pipes of the organ. Some organs have thousands of pipes. Percussion instruments. To percuss means to strike. Percussion instruments are musical instruments that the player must strike. There are different ways to strike a percussion instrument. Some are struck by the player's hand, like a congo drum. Others, like a snare drum and the timpani, use some kind of stick to strike the instrument. Some percussion instruments, like the celesta and the glockenspiel, are able to produce different pitches so they can play a tune. Others, like a snare drum, cannot produce different pitches. They cannot play a tune. Examples of percussion instruments. One way to group percussion instruments is to see how they produce a sound. Some produce sound through vibration. These include castanets, celesta, chimes. Symbols, handbells, steel drum, triangle, and xylophone. Some produce sounds when a membrane is struck. The membrane is the material that is tightly stretched across the top of a drum. This group includes all of the drums, from congo drums to timpani. Other percussion instruments make sounds by striking a string. This includes the piano and the hammered dulcimer. Other kinds of instruments. The four groups of instruments, brass, string, wind, and percussion, have been used by humans for hundreds and in some cases for thousands of years. Electronic instruments are new compared to the other kinds of instruments. These instruments produce sounds by using electronics. Examples include electronic organs and synthesizers. Other kinds of instruments are accordions, alp horn, bagpipe, bazooka, didgeridoo, glass harmonica, gongs, harmonicas, jug, kazoo, metal pipes, nose flute, pan flute, sirens, and whistles. Meet Kyle, written by Laura Singer, Puppy Barks. Emma and her mom are playing with the family's new puppy, Fiona. They are at Emma's favorite spot in the playground. When Fiona barks, it sounds squeaky. Squeak, squeak, Fiona barks. Emma giggles and gently pets Fiona's fur. Fiona relaxes. Then she shuts her eyes and naps. No more squeaky barks for now. It's time to relax for a little bit. More squeaks. Squeak, squeak. Suddenly, Emma and her mom hear more squeaking. The squeaks sound like Fiona's barks, but Fiona is still taking a nap. Emma quietly asks her mom, Do you hear that squeaky sound, Mom? It's not Fiona. Look, she's still napping. Squeak, squeak. Emma does not see any other puppies barking. What is making that sound? Emma wonders, speaking softly, so Fiona can nap. Emma's mom says, I don't know. I am curious about it, though. Emma says, Me too. 
Ray's new friend. Emma sees her older brother Ray playing on the slide. Ray is playing with a boy Emma does not know. Come see my new puppy, says Ray to the boy. Ray and the boy start running. Squeak, squeak, squeak. Emma hears the squeaking sound again. Oh, Emma says quietly to her mom. The squeaking sound is coming from the boy with Ray. Now Fiona is awake again. She barks her squeaky puppy bark and wags her tail. Emma meets Kyle. Fiona loves Ray, and she loves to meet new people. Ray gently picks up the pup. He lets his friend pet her. They giggle at how cute the little dog is. Emma wants to meet her brother's new friend. She asks him, What's your name? The boy does not answer. So Emma tries a different question. Do you like our puppy? she asks. But the boy does not look at Emma, and he does not answer her. Emma has more questions. Emma says quietly to her mom, Why isn't Ray's friend answering me? Maybe he can't talk, or maybe he doesn't like me. Emma's mom thinks for a moment. Then she says, Well, I guess not everyone is comfortable around other people, especially new people. Oh, Emma says, but she is curious, so she tugs on her brother's shirt. Ray says, What's up? Emma speaks very quietly to Ray, so only he hears her question. Does your friend know how to talk? She asks him. Kyle talks. Yes, Kyle can talk, but not in the way you might expect. Ray then turns to Kyle and says, Hey, Kyle, this is my sister Emma. Emma says, Hi, Kyle. But Kyle still does not say anything. He still does not look at Emma. Suddenly, Emma smiles. She has a new idea for a question. She asks, Kyle, do you have a dog? Kyle says, Kyle, do you have a dog? Emma sees that Ray was right, that Kyle can talk. Kyle has autism. But Kyle repeated what Emma said instead of answering her question. The other strange thing, Emma thinks, is that Kyle's voice sounds a little bit like a robot. Kyle is smiling and giggling a little bit. Emma quietly asks Ray, Why did Kyle repeat what I said? Is he laughing at me? Ray says, Kyle is not laughing at you. He is just happy to be with Fiona. Kyle has autism. He gets very focused on things he likes. Our Brains Ray then says, Kyle does not always know how to say things to other people. So he sometimes repeats what you say instead of saying one of his own ideas. Emma thinks about this. Then she says, But why? Ray says, Everybody's brain works a little differently. Your brain and my brain work differently. Emma agrees with this. She says, Yup, that is true, Ray. Ray continues, Kyle is in my class at school. He has a special teacher who helps him. Many Kinds of Autism Kyle's teacher told us that each kid with autism is different because there are many kinds of autism, says Ray. Oh, says Emma, 
What kind of autism does Kyle have? Ray answers, Well, Kyle has the kind of autism where he can talk and play with other kids. He just needs a little bit of help with these things. Ray continues, There is also a girl in our class with autism, and she needs more help talking and playing with other kids. A special teacher. Emma asks, Oh, what is her name? Ray says, Her name is Lila, and she is a great friend. Lila has the kind of autism where she does not talk at all. It is very hard for Lila to understand other kids, but she does want to play. So the special teacher gives her extra help. We are all learning how to help Lila play games with everyone. Bray helps Kyle. Emma asks, What is Kyle thinking about right now? Ray says, I don't know, but let's talk to him. Hey, Kyle, do you like our puppy? says Ray. Do you like our puppy? repeats Kyle. Ray then says, Kyle, I am asking you a question. Then Kyle and Ray giggle together. It is fun to be silly together with a good friend. Kyle then says, Yes, I like your puppy, Ray. They all have fun. Kyle's voice still sounds a little like a robot. But he is smiling. Emma smiles. Kyle looks at Ray and Emma. He sees that they are both smiling. This makes Kyle happy. He wants everyone to keep smiling. He repeats, Yes, I like your puppy, Ray. Then everyone giggles. They are having a very good time together. Emma wants to talk to Kyle some more. Kyle, I have a question for you, she says. Kyle looks at Emma. He is still smiling from all the fun. Emma and Kyle talk together. Do you have your own dog at home? asks Emma. Kyle thinks about what Emma asked. He is looking at Emma, but he is not saying anything, just thinking. Ray says, Kyle, you can answer Emma's question. Go ahead. Finally, Kyle says, No, I do not have a dog at home. Emma starts to say something, but before she can get her words out, Kyle says, I have a cat. It makes Kyle happy to think about his cat. He giggles again. Off to the monkey bars. It makes Emma happy to see Kyle giggle. She giggles again, too. Soon, Ray is giggling with them. Kyle gets an idea. He says, Let's play on the monkey bars. Ray says, Great idea, Kyle. Come on, Emma. Come play with Kyle and me, he exclaims. Emma and Ray's mom is talking to Kyle's dad. She gently takes Fiona from Kyle's arms. The three children run toward the monkey bars. But when they arrive, there is a problem. Emma's Fear Emma has never been on the monkey bars before. She holds her arms up but does not grab the first bar. Emma is afraid she will fall down on the ground. Emma puts her arms down. She holds onto the sides of the ladder. She takes in a big breath and lets it slowly out. Then 
She takes in another big breath and lets that one slowly out, too. Kyle is very interested in what Emma is doing. Relaxing Breaths Kyle says, Relaxing breath, relaxing breath. Emma smiles at Kyle. Yes, relaxing breath, relaxing breath, relaxing breath. La, la, la. Emma and Kyle sing together. Relaxing breath, la, la, la. Emma then says, Phew, I'm ready now. Then she puts her arms out and grabs the first monkey bar. The rest of the way is a little bit scary, but Emma goes all the way across. Relaxing breath, la la la, sings Kyle. Emma says, Kyle, do you like to do relaxing breaths? An Understanding Friend Kyle thinks for a moment. He does not look at Emma, but he does answer her. He says, Yes, I like to do relaxing breaths when I... Kyle stops speaking and looks at Ray. He smiles at Ray. Then Kyle finishes his thought. I am scared or when I am not comfortable. Kyle's voice still sounds a little like a robot, and he takes a long time before he answers a question. But Emma does not mind. Heading home. Now she is starting to understand more about Kyle's autism. Mostly, Emma just wants to be Kyle's friend and play with him again. Kyle's dad puts his hand gently on his son's back. He says, Come on, Kyle. Let's go home for dinner. Then everyone talks all at once. Goodbye, goodbye. On the walk home, Emma says, At first, I thought that Kyle did not like me, and I thought that he did not know how to talk. or friends. Emma continues, but now I understand that Kyle has autism, so even though he wants to play and be friends, he might not know how. Unless a friend like you is there to help him, Emma points out, looking at Ray. Ray replies, I like helping Kyle. He's my friend. And we all help each other, really. Kyle helped you when you were scared of going on the monkey bars for the first time. Making Plans Right, agrees Emma, adding, Everyone needs extra help and understanding sometimes. Ray says, For me, it's swimming. I'm still trying to learn that one. Then Emma says, I hope we can play with Kyle again. Ray says, Can Kyle come over tomorrow, Mom? Emma's and Ray's mom answers, Of course! Yay! shout Emma and Ray. Squeak, squeak! barks Fiona. Clayton Does the Unthinkable Written by Lydia Light I stuffed a pancake in my mouth and grabbed my backpack. Bye, honey, Mom called out as I closed the front door. Have a great day at school. Yeah, whatever, I muttered. The truth was, it was probably not going to be a good day. Every day was pretty much the same, and none of them were great. I didn't like going to school, and grade five was getting tough. Lars was one of the main reasons. He was the class bully and he took particular enjoyment in making my life difficult. He liked to pick on me because of the way I am. Ever since I can remember, everyone constantly told me I was different. My doctors and family tried to use positive words like gifted or special needs, 
but it all boiled down to the same thing. I had Asperger's syndrome. I've always been this way, so it felt normal to me. But I knew I wasn't like everyone else. I knew that I didn't act like other kids my age. I had trouble making friends, or even looking people in the eye. I wasn't good with change, and I had my own way of doing things. My sister said I was compulsive when she saw the way I arranged my socks by color and size. I also didn't enjoy the same things as my classmates, like going to parties and hanging out. I couldn't be bothered with other people. Honestly, I would rather be alone and play Minecraft. When I got to school, I didn't make eye contact with anyone and kept to myself. It was better that way. It was easier for me if people acted like I wasn't there. I marched straight to my locker to do my morning ritual. Every morning, I rearranged and counted my Star Wars figurines. They have to be in a particular order. Hey, Clayton! Trevor called out. Trevor was pretty much my only friend. He was a total nerd. But that didn't bother me. How's it going? Trevor asked. Geez, can't you see that I'm busy? I said with an annoyed tone. You know, I count my action figures every morning. Trevor just laughed. He didn't mind how different I was. All right, see you later, Gator. The day went on as usual. Math class was amazing. The funny thing was that I wasn't good with people, but I was really good with numbers. I could add and multiply numbers all day long without making any mistakes. After that, it was gym class, which was my least favorite. I wasn't what you would call sporty. During the volleyball match, I couldn't serve the ball over the net. I felt stupid. Look, everybody, it's chicken legs. Lars yelled out as some of the other classmates giggled. Chicken legs was one of the nicknames Lars gave me. I didn't even think it was that funny. Ah, little chicken legs can't get the ball over the net again. Lars continued. Maybe we should put the net lower before he starts crying. Wah wah! I started clicking my tongue. I did that when I got nervous. It just made everyone laugh at me even more. I didn't like most people, but I really detested Lars. He was the meanest guy I had ever met. He knew I had Aspergers. Everybody did, but that didn't stop him from being cruel. It was lunchtime now, so everybody piled into the cafeteria. I sat at a table alone with Trevor. When I ate, I had particular habits. First of all, I only ate certain things. If a food had a gross texture or smell, like eggs, it was out. Also. Different foods couldn't touch each other, or I couldn't eat them. So I opened my lunchbox and placed the food separately on pieces of saran wrap. Lars crept up behind me. Why do you have to be such a freak? He yelled out. You're so weird. I didn't know what to say. I felt so helpless. When I got home, I plopped down onto my bed. Honey, are you okay? Mom asked. It's Lars. He was making fun of me again today. I cried. Oh, I see. She replied. Remember, I told that sometimes kids like to be mean, especially when you're different. It doesn't matter what he says. You should just ignore him. This was always her advice. It's just that sometimes it was hard to ignore it. Some days I got so annoyed with Lars that I felt like hitting him. I would never do that, of course. Other days, I wanted to say mean things back to him, like how dumb he is and how he can't solve a math problem to save his life. But Mom always said to never stoop to his level. So how do I stand up for myself in the right way? Things got worse the next day. I was counting my Star Wars figurines in my locker during the lunch break, and suddenly I heard Lars behind me. What you got there, chicken legs? He sneered. There was no way I was going to let Lars touch my action figures, but before I had a chance to do anything, he took my head and slammed it into my locker. Then he grabbed some of my action figures and ran off. This was the last straw. I couldn't let him get away with this, so I ran after him. 
down the hallway. Lars ran outside into the courtyard, and I followed him. He was going towards the street. Before I could catch up with him, he threw the action figures into the street. I watched as they all got run over by the cars passing by. My heart sank. This was too much. I could feel the blood boiling inside my body. I wanted to throw Lars to the ground, but I controlled myself. Instead, I did something I have never done before. I spoke up. Lars, I shouted. I've had enough of this. I yelled so loud that all the students stopped to listen. I'm getting really tired of coming to school and being bullied by you. It's not fair. You know what else is not fair? I was born with Asperger's syndrome. I never asked for it, but it came anyway. I've been in and out of hospitals for over half my life, and I have to do therapy four times a week. I know everybody thinks I'm weird, but the truth is, I feel normal. This is the way I am, and I can't change it. So I'm not gonna take your crap anymore. Just then, a few teachers ran out because they had heard what happened. I felt really good about myself. It felt great to stand up and speak my mind. The next day, during morning assembly, Principal Jenner spoke to the whole school. I want everybody to understand that we have a zero tolerance policy for bullying at our school. He said. Lars has been suspended for three days, and if his actions continue, he can get expelled. I want all of you to feel safe walking down these halls. It felt good that justice had been served. I still had Asperger's syndrome, and people may choose to make fun of me again, but the bullying with Lars was over. I felt more confident than I had in a while. It felt good to stand up for myself. My first book of food: fruits, vegetables, bread, cheese, milk, burger, cake, popcorn. Pizza, pasta, waffles, cereal, pancake, water, juice, sandwich, cookies. Ice cream, yogurt, baked beans, egg, meatballs, fish sticks, jam, soup, crackers. Jordan and Justine's weekend adventures, plants, parts one and two, written and created by Tennille Edwards and Latoya Edwards, M.D. Part one, plants and peanuts. Jordan and Justine were helping their mother, Mrs. Daniels, in the garden one sunny Saturday morning. Jordan, you can hold the pumpkin seeds and make the holes, and Justine, you can stick one pumpkin seed into each hole and then cover the hole with dirt. Mrs. Daniels said, "Mommy, what are you doing?" Justine asked. "Sweetheart, I'm going to water the new seeds." "How do plants grow?" Jordan asked. "Well." Plants start out as seeds. Inside each seed are special foods that feed the seed while it grows. Then the seed sprouts into a plant stem, and the stem starts to grow leaf buds. 
Mrs. Daniels explained. Buds? Justine asked. Buds are baby leaves. Mrs. Daniels pointed to a little leaf sprouting from the ground. But, Mommy, plants need sunlight, too, Jordan said. That is true, Jordy. The leaves on plants take in the sunlight. But plants also need water, Mrs. Daniels added. Where does the water go? Jordan asked. The water goes into the soil, Mrs. Daniels explained. This? Justine asked as she pointed to the ground. Yes, Mrs. Daniels said. This is dirt, Mommy, Justine said. Dirt and soil are the same thing. Water travels down into the soil to the roots of the plants, where the water is absorbed, Mrs. Daniels explained. Why are we planting pumpkin seeds? Jordan asked. I like pumpkin pie, and pumpkins are for Halloween, Justine said. Those are good reasons, but pumpkins are also good for you. They have vitamin C, vitamin E, and other good stuff to make you strong, Mrs. Daniels said as she rubbed Justine's stomach. Jordan made muscles with his arms. Strong like me, Mommy? he asked. Yes, strong just like you, Mrs. Daniels said. At lunchtime, Jordan and Justine got the bread and jelly out of the refrigerator to help Mrs. Daniels make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Mommy, where do peanuts come from? Justine asked. Peanuts come from ground flowers. They grow underground, Mrs. Daniels said. Who created peanut butter? Jordan asked. An African-American scientist named George Washington Carver. How old is peanut butter? Justine asked. I don't know, but we can look it up, Jordan said. Yes, we can. We can find out by searching on the Internet for peanut butter and George Washington Carver. Right after lunch, Jordan and Justine sat down at the computer in the family room. Mrs. Daniels wrote down Mr. Carver's name for them to type into the search engine. Here it is, Jordan said. What does it say, Jordy? Justine asked. Peanut butter was created at the Tuskegee Institute in the early 1900s. That's the Tuskegee Institute. It says here, Jordan, that Mr. Carver was invited to speak at a congressional hearing about his work with peanuts. That means he presented his reports on peanuts before the government, Mrs. Daniels explained. After that, he became known around the country as the Peanut Man, Jordan said. Good job, you two, Mrs. Daniels said. Jordan and Justine gave each other a high five. Do you know why it's good to eat peanut butter? Mrs. Daniels asked them. No, Jordan and Justine said. Then look that up, too. We only eat things that are good for our bodies, Mrs. Daniels said. Why, Mommy? Justine asked. Eating foods that have vitamins and nutrients helps us to grow just like plants, Mrs. Daniels answered. I found it. Peanut butter has antioxidants, Jordan said confused. That word is antioxidants, Mrs. Daniels said. Oh, antioxidants, what do they do? Jordan asked. They prevent disease. Now, you too make sure to tell Dad what you learned when he gets home. He is going to be so proud of you. 
Mrs. Daniels gave Jordan and Justine both high fives. Lesson 1. Plants are living organisms like you and me. So, just like we need nutrients, water, and sunlight, plants need those things too. Lesson 2. When you don't know something, you can research to find out. Look inside of a book at the library or search through a book, newspaper, or journal online to find out. Lesson 3. Eat foods with vitamins and antioxidants. Vitamins and antioxidants protect your body and help you grow up healthy and strong. Say it out loud. I eat foods that have vitamins and antioxidants to help my body grow. Photosynthesis Justine was playing with her toys in the family room while Jordan was looking at his terrarium. Justine placed her teddy bear on Jordan's shoulder. How do plants eat? What makes them grow? she asked him. I can show you, Jordan said. Jordan took the lid off of his terrarium. Look in here. See these plants are growing, Jordan said. How can you tell? Justine asked, confused. Jordan grabbed her hand and pulled out his magic magnifying glass from his back pocket. Imagine I may. Imagine I might. Let us see what photosynthesis is really like, Jordan said with excitement. They began to spin around and around like a merry-go-round. They spun so fast that the room became a blur. Justine started to laugh and cried out, Whoa! Whoa! In a flash, they became the size of two ants. And Justine suddenly realized she was standing on a leaf. Cool, Justine said as she touched the leaf's smooth surface. Jordan started to explain. Plants eat and grow by using photosynthesis. Photosenses? Justine asked. No, photosynthesis. That means to make food from light, Jordan explained. Plants use sunlight to make energy. They use energy to grow healthy and strong, Jordan said. Then he pointed up toward the rays of sunlight shining through the terrarium glass. The plants use carbon dioxide, CO2. This is a gas that's in the air. Living animals like you and me exhale carbon dioxide every time we breathe out, Jordan told Justine. She took one long breath in and then exhaled out. I exhaled carbon dioxide. Did you see me, Jordy? Justine asked. Yes, he said. Justine clapped her hands. She was excited to learn about carbon dioxide. We breathe in oxygen gas, O2, in order to live. The plants use carbon dioxide gas along with water, H2O, in order to survive, Jordan said. How do plants get water inside the terrarium? Does it rain in here? Justine asked. Moisture in the terrarium is naturally produced. The environment, which means everything around us inside of the terrarium, creates moisture through the mixture of air and heat from the sun. Sometimes people also add water too, but it does not rain in here, Jordan answered. With these two ingredients, carbon dioxide and water plants make a special type of food 
carbohydrate, which is used for energy to grow. Plants can make carbohydrates, and we eat carbohydrates like bread and cereal. Our carbohydrates come from plants. Six CO two plus six H two O plus sunlight equal C six H twelve O six plus six O two. Or carbon dioxide plus water plus light energy equal carbohydrate plus oxygen. Jordan held out his magic magnifying glass. He held it over a plant leaf to show Justine a plant cell. Look inside this cell, Justine. This is where all of the action happens. The carbon dioxide and water go in and out. Come carbohydrates and oxygen. Plants make oxygen. Jordan explained. Wow, this is amazing, Jordy. Justine said while looking around at all of the different types of leaves in the terrarium. It's time to go. Now remember, we need oxygen to live. As we breathe in oxygen, we make more carbon dioxide for the plants to use. It's like we help each other. Plants make oxygen for us to breathe, and we exhale carbon dioxide for plants to take in. Jordan said, "I understand now. Oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. This is fun." Justine said. She gave Jordan a big hug. Justine held Jordan's hand while he held out the magic magnifying glass with his other hand. Together they said, "Imagine I may, imagine I might, go back home now that we know what photosynthesis is really like." Lesson one. Animals and plants depend on each other to live. We need plants to produce oxygen for us to breathe, and plants need us to exhale carbon dioxide so that they can create food. Lesson two: Photosynthesis is a process where plants use sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water to create food. Lesson three: Plants make carbohydrates. We can eat carbohydrates for energy. Chasing rainbows, written by Lydia Light. Abigail loved rainbows. They were so beautiful. One day, she saw a wonderful rainbow in the sky outside her window. Then she began to wonder, where did rainbows start? Where did they end? Was there really a leprechaun with a pot of gold at the end of them? She thought about it day and night. She asked her friends, but nobody knew the answer. So she decided to do something about it. The next day. Abigail set off with her dog Poodles to find the answer to her questions. Okay, Poodles, she said in excitement. Are you ready to go on an adventure? Poodles barked and wagged his tail. Abigail packed her backpack with a camera, her favorite blanket, and some treats. She told her mother she was going for a walk. Luckily. It had just rained, and there was another beautiful rainbow in the sky. This will be so easy, Abigail thought to herself. All they had to do was follow the rainbow to get to its beginning. They began walking. They had been walking for an hour, and Abigail still couldn't find the beginning of the rainbow. It seemed that every time she would get closer to the rainbow, it would move further away. 
How strange! She was starting to get tired. She decided to take a break. She sat down in a park with poodles and munched on some treats. She got her camera out and took a picture of the rainbow. It still seemed so far away. Abigail was determined, and she didn't want to give up. Okay, Poodles, she declared. We have to keep walking. Poodles groaned. He was very tired and wanted to go home. Not yet, said Abigail. We have to find the rainbow first. They continued walking towards the rainbow. Pretty soon, it was very dark outside. Abigail realized that the rainbow had disappeared. She also didn't recognize the street she was on. Oh no! Abigail and Poodles were lost. They were exhausted, and now they were scared. How would they find their way back home? Abigail imagined her mother's smiling face and began to cry. Suddenly, a car honked. Abigail! Someone shouted. It sounded like her mom. Could it be? Yes, her mom was driving in her car looking for them. She was very worried. What on earth are you doing here? she asked. You are so far from home, and it is the middle of the night. Oh, Mom, Abigail cried. I hope you're not angry. I just wanted to find the end of the rainbow, but then I got lost. Her mom said that she was not angry, but that Abigail should never walk so far without an adult. Abigail and Poodles got into the car and drove home. That night, they both slept really well. The next day after supper, Abigail's mom wanted to speak to her. Now tell me, she said, what do you want to know about rainbows? Abigail said that she wanted to know where rainbows began and ended. She also wanted to know if there was really a pot of gold at the end of them. Well, let's have a look on the computer, her mom replied. You can find out lots of interesting things there. It turned out that rainbows actually have no end or beginning. They form when there is sun and rain, and they are full circles. They just get cut in half by the ground. They appear when the light of the sun is reflected back to us by the droplets of water. It may seem like a rainbow is a real object that can be approached, but it's not. It's just a special beam of light. That is why you could never find the end of it, Abigail's mom said. The rainbow's light moved as you did. Oh, said Abigail, what about the pot of gold? Her mother laughed. There are no such things as leprechauns and pots of gold, she said, as she tucked her daughter into bed. Abigail was kind of disappointed. Rainbows were less magical than she imagined. As she drifted off to sleep, she began to dream. She was on another adventure with poodles. They found the biggest, most beautiful rainbow ever. In the dream, she was able to find the end of it. As she ran towards it, she screamed in joy. At the end of the rainbow was the cutest leprechaun she ever saw. He was guarding a big pot of gold. When she woke up, she told poodles about her dream. Sometimes life is better when you use your imagination, she said. Timo Walks Through the Farm Written by Jason Brown This is a story of a little boy. A little boy who had a little farm. 
This little boy's name is Timo. Little Timo and his big dad worked on the little farm every day. Timo loved to feed all the animals. Timo's little farm had pigs, goats, chickens, and cows. Timo had names for all of his little animal friends. In the pig pen, there was a little piglet named Skippy. Skippy was a happy pig who was always bouncing around the other piglets. Timo loved watching the little goats climb on the roofs of their houses. The little goats were so funny to watch as they hopped from one place to the next. Timo's little farm had many little chickens. The chickens were always hungry. Every time the little chickens saw Timo with a big bag of corn, they would start running after little Timo. Timo's favorite animals were the cows. The cows were not little. Even the baby cows were bigger than Timo. Little Timo would talk to the cows with a big moo, and the cows would answer back moo. Timo's little farm also had some little apple trees and little carrots. Timo's dad was in charge of growing the apple trees and planting the carrots. Timo loved to pick the little apples right out of the tree. But Timo was too little to reach way up high. Timo's dad was always there to lift him up on his shoulders so Timo could reach. Timo and his dad would pick many little carrots and fill up the biggest baskets. Timo and his dad would crunch on the little carrots while they were filling the baskets. Timo's little farm was a fun place. Little Timo and his big dad loved all the little animals, even the big cows. New Find Written by Sippy S. Kindergarten Dolch Words R At B Did Do Into Like Knew Now On Saw She There They This Two Under Want What Who With Sarah and Tara are sisters. They like to be outdoors. They like to look at the flowers. They like to look at the birds. There are woods where they live. They like to look at squirrels on trees. They like to look at birds' nests. Today, Tara and Sarah are looking for a rabbit. They saw a rabbit run away into the woods. They want to find it. Sarah looks near the flowers. She sees blue butterflies. But she does not find the rabbit. Tara looks in the woods. She looks near the trees. She looks under the trees. 
but she does not find the rabbit. They look near the creek. They see fish. They see ducks. But they do not find the rabbit. Sarah and Tara do not find the rabbit. But what do they see now? A boy under a tree with his tent. Who is this boy? This boy is Jack. Jack likes to be outdoors, too. Sarah and Tara did not find the rabbit, but they did find a new friend. Tara and Sarah like to be blank. How are Tara and Sarah related? What do you think the girls are saying? Why? What are Tara and Sarah looking for today? Do you like the outdoors? What places would you like to explore? Food Making the Right Choices Written by Edward Allen Kurtz Introduction Everybody has to eat, right? Even plants and animals other than humans have to eat. It's one of the things that keeps us alive and growing. Things like the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat. There are so many food choices that it's sometimes hard to know what's good and what's not good. In this book, we will learn about healthy food, food that tastes good but is also good for us. This is called good nutrition. Nutrition means food or nourishment, and hopefully we can learn how to make healthy choices. Why make healthy food choices? Why does it matter so much what kind of food you eat? Why does everyone say, eat your vegetables? What's wrong with eating a candy bar and drinking a soda? It's very simple. Everything you put in your mouth goes into your body, and everything that goes into your body has an effect on your body and its growth. Your body is like an engine. You have to put the right fuel in it. It's like a car. You wouldn't put chocolate milk in the gas tank, would you? You put gasoline in the gas tank. So, what are smart food choices? My Plate The United States Department of Agriculture started making nutrition guides over 100 years ago. These guides used to be called food pyramids, but the one that is now being used is called My Plate. It is a diagram with five food groups, four on a plate plus one in a glass. The four food groups consist of 20% fruits, 30% grains, 20% protein, and 30% vegetables. And the food group in the glass is dairy. This means that 50% of your meal should be fruit and vegetables. Let's look more closely at these food groups. Fruits about 20% of your meal should be made up of fruit. Why is fruit so important? Fruits contain many good things for you. One thing is vitamin C. 
Vitamin C helps your body in several ways, like helping to heal wounds and helping your body stay strong and fight some diseases. Another healthy thing about fruit is that it contains lots of fiber. Fiber is good for your digestive system. It helps to keep things moving through your digestive tract. Fruits are also low in calories, so they help to prevent you from gaining weight. Grains Fruits are easy to understand, but what are grains and what do they do? Grains are cereals. They are part of certain grasses that we can eat. Grains can be divided into two groups, and it's important to understand these. Whole grain means that the grain is in its natural form and is rich in minerals, protein, vitamins, and other good things. Refined grains are not as healthy. Most of the good stuff is removed. Whole grain breads and cereals are good for you, but things made of white flour, like cakes, are not as healthy. Protein Eating protein is important, especially when you are growing up. It is not only a source of fuel for your engine, your body, but it also helps to develop tissues in your body. These tissues include many things like your skin, hair, muscles, and organs, like your heart and brain. There are many sources of protein, and it's a good idea to change these from meal to meal. Sources are chicken, dairy products, eggs, fish, meat, nuts, and soy. Vegetarians don't eat meat, but when they combine a grain and a legume, they make protein. Vegetables Vegetables are plants or parts of plants that we can eat. Vegetables can be eaten raw, like a salad, or cooked, like stir-fried vegetables. Vegetables don't contain very much protein, and some contain different amounts of minerals and vitamins. So why does everyone tell you to eat your vegetables? One reason is that they contain lots of fiber, which is good for your digestive system. Vegetables contain nutrients that are good for your hair and skin, and like fruits, vegetables help keep your body healthy by fighting different diseases. Dairy The My Plate picture shows a glass with the word dairy in it. Most people think of milk when they think of dairy products, but there are many other dairy products like cheese and yogurt. Dairy products are good for your engine because they give you lots of energy. Where do dairy products come from? We usually think of cows, but they also come from camels, goats, sheep, and yaks. Not everyone can have dairy products. Some people are lactose intolerant and have to avoid milk. They can drink soy milk instead. Some Smart Eating Habits Smart eating isn't just about what you put into your mouth. Here are some good eating habits. Eating together with your family is a good idea. If you help your parents prepare meals, you will learn a lot about food. For example, how food is prepared is important. Food fried in oil is not as healthy as food that is prepared without oil. Portion control is another good habit. Eat moderate portions of the five food groups for your meal. If you are not full, eat a little more. This is better than starting out with too much on your plate. More Smart Eating Habits A calorie is a unit of energy. Counting calories is smart. If you eat 2,000 calories in a day, but only burn off 1,000 calories in exercise, you'll gain weight. Don't skip breakfast. 
When you wake up, you have not eaten for a long time, so it's the most important meal of the day. Organic foods have not been sprayed with dangerous chemicals, so they are safe to eat. Scientists change the cells in food to create new varieties or new colors. These foods are genetically modified or GMO. Non-GMO foods are safer and healthier. Why is junk food bad for your body? What is junk food? It's food that doesn't have much nutritional value. It might taste good, but you have to ask yourself, why am I eating this? Will it be good for my body, or will it do something bad to my body? Junk food can be sweets like cake and candy, and it can be fast food like hamburgers and pizza. A little is okay, but too much is not good for you. Why? Because junk food is full of things that aren't good for your body, like calories, fat, salt, and sugar, and is missing good things like minerals and vitamins. Minerals and vitamins, calcium. Calcium is one of 118 chemical elements like gold, hydrogen, iron, and silver. But calcium is found in lots of different kinds of food, and it's a good thing. Calcium is very important in helping to make the bones of your skeletal system strong and healthy. Some of the foods that contain calcium include almonds, avocado, broccoli, kale, salmon, sardines, and dairy products like cheese, milk, and yogurt. Calcium also helps your body in other ways. It helps your muscles to work well and also helps your nervous system. Minerals and Vitamins Iron Iron is a chemical element like calcium, and like calcium, your body needs iron. And fortunately, there is iron in some of the food that you eat. There's iron in beans, beef, black-eyed peas, cereals, chicken, chickpeas, fish, lentils, soybeans, spinach, turkey, and vegetables, especially leafy vegetables. Why does your body need iron? Iron is a very important mineral because it helps your blood. Your blood moves nutrients and oxygen from your lungs to other parts of your body, and iron helps your blood do this job. Minerals and Vitamins Potassium Potassium is another chemical element like calcium and iron and it too is important to your body and can be found in some of the food that you eat. Good sources of potassium are bananas, broccoli, cantaloupe, mushrooms, orange juice, potatoes, prunes, soybeans, spinach, sweet potatoes, yellow fin tuna, watermelon, winter squash, and dairy products like cheese, milk, and yogurt. Why do you need to eat food that has potassium in it? Potassium helps keep your blood pressure from getting high and prevents kidney stones. Minerals and Vitamins Vitamin A Vitamins are just as important as minerals to keep your body healthy. There are 13 vitamins and vitamin A is at the top of the list. Some of the food sources for vitamin A are apricots, carrots, cereals, eggs, kale, liver, mangoes, milk, papayas, peaches, pumpkin, spinach, and sweet potatoes. What is so important about making sure you have enough vitamin A in the food that you eat? Your eyes. Vitamin A helps your vision. It also helps your heart and other organs, and it helps your immune system protect 
against diseases. Minerals and Vitamins Vitamin C Almost everyone has heard of vitamin C. It's in your orange juice, right? Where else can you find vitamin C? It's found in bell peppers, baked potatoes, broccoli, cantaloupe, kiwis, strawberries, tomatoes, and citrus fruits other than oranges, like grapefruit. What are some of the things that vitamin C does to help keep you healthy? The most well-known reason for making sure you have enough vitamin C is that it helps your immune system fight off diseases. Vitamin C also helps protect your body against cell damage. Minerals and Vitamins Vitamin D Vitamin D is another important part of a healthy diet. Where do you find vitamin D? It's found in cereals, dairy products, eggs, orange juice, soy milk, and fish like mackerel, salmon, and tuna. What is so important about getting enough vitamin D in the food you eat? It does several things to help your body. First, it helps your immune system to protect your body from diseases. Second, it helps you to grow strong bones. And third, it helps your nervous system send messages from your brain to other parts of your body. What do professional athletes eat? Professional athletes eat many of the same things that you and I eat, but they have to be very smart about their food choices. Eating food that gives you energy is important in sports, but there are good and bad choices for energy-producing food. Athletes know that sugary things like sodas and candy give you quick energy, but they also know that this energy disappears quickly. Instead, athletes make wise choices and base their diets on carbohydrates, minerals, protein, and vitamins. They also drink lots of pure water. Interesting Facts Humans are able to eat about 2,000 different kinds of plants. More than 80% of the strawberries produced in the United States are grown in California. A sweet potato and a regular potato are not closely related. Native Americans dyed their clothes using the colors they got from berries. You cry when you chop onions because a gas is released into the air, and this can rise up to your eyes and irritate them. For thousands of years, Chinese people have been eating melon seeds because they believe that the seeds are good for the digestive system. Most people think that pumpkins and tomatoes are vegetables, but because they have seeds, they are really fruit. Apples float in water because they are 25% air. China produces about 10 million tons of garlic per year, making it the largest producer of garlic in the world. India produces about 22 million tons of bananas per year, making it the largest producer of bananas in the world. It is 20 degrees cooler on the inside of a cucumber then on the outside. Most humans are omnivores, which means that they eat both plants and animals. Vegetarians do not eat meat and fish. Vegans are vegetarians who do not eat animal products like eggs and cheese. Strawberries are not berries, but instead they are receptacles, which are the thickened part of the plant's stem.